virtually every constituency of Ahmedabad. What is the sense that you're getting? Is this a sign that the BJP is worried? Or is it that they just want to consolidate their hold, especially in Ahmedabad, where they got 17 out of the 21 seats last time? Well, it's classic BJP playbook, Rajdeep. You'd know that better. Uh, to go the whole hog, uh, it is the final chapter. But, uh, you know, you were talking about the voting percentage there. Uh, 2017, the first phase stood at 68%. Uh, right now, today, uh, it's clocking in close to 60%. Where Saurashtra is concerned, I would reckon, and Mr. Shastri would be able to add, that there could be a point of worry for the Bharatiya Janata Party in areas like Rajkot, Jamnagar, uh, Bhavnagar, uh, strong urban pockets of Saurashtra, where usually the BJP has done well. Uh, you know, the voting percentage being recorded there is rather low. Botard, for example, is only 51%. The BJP was hoping uh, that uh, there'd be, you know, maximum number of people who'd go out and vote there. We were trying to speak to some of, uh, you know, the local leaders here. And there is a sense of concern on what's gone down in Saurashtra. Now, how much, uh, you know, it will affect uh, the second phase, which is on the 5th of December. We'll only know, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, you know, the polling happens. But uh, the sense that we could get on ground, uh, Rajdeep, is yes, definitely the BJP would want to consolidate in the second phase. Uh, 61 seats in central uh, Gujarat. They are very, very strong here. Uh, lots of urban pockets. 32 in North Gujarat go to vote uh, in the second phase. Out of that, in 2017, 18 were taken by the Congress. Only 14 went to the BJP. The BJP would want to correct that math. So, yes, one, the sheer fact uh, of uh, Ahmedabad, they want to better their tally where mm -hmm. Ahmedabad is concerned of the 21. They want to, uh, you know, maximize that. But on the other hand, where optics are concerned, the optics uh, of uh, uh, you know, a groundswell of sorts is what we saw right now in that 50-kilometer road stretch of right. that road show. I've never covered a road show like that. I haven't even even heard of a road show which goes on for three hours. So yes, they'd want the optics to also carry forward going into the uh, second phase, which the BJP would hope to consolidate on. You know, Sandeep Shastri, it's the optics of a road show, but the reality of very a relatively moderate turnout. Now, what does that mean? Does a moderate turnout should it be worry for the ruling party or should it be worry for a divided, seemingly divided opposition in what could be for the first time, at least in a long time, a potentially three-cornered race or three-cornered fights in some parts of Gujarat? What does a relatively lower turnout mean in cephalogical terms? Uh, Rajdeep, one of the unresolved dilemmas of voting behavior is the absence of empirical proof that low or high voting turnout favors ruling or opposition party. But let me just make two points as I see what has happened today. If today actually saw a low voter turnout, I think the question that would be raised is A, uh, does it reflect a sense of dissatisfaction, complacency, among the voters who have consistently voted for the ruling party after all these years of the party being in mm -hmm. power does it reflect a dissatisfaction does it reflect a complacency on the other hand has the challenger not been strong enough or right. has the challenger's attempt not been enough to be able to get the voters out i think rajdeep the question would be uh, would if the silent have spoken, would it have been very different from the voice that is being heard? So for me, given the past studies we have done on Gujarat, especially the governance study, uh, there is a high level of uh, dissatisfaction, which does not mean that there is a vote against the ruling party. So I think this high level, this this dissatisfaction which may be there in a segment of the voters and the complacency which may be there in another segment of voters may have actually contributed to this lower voter turnout along with as i said the inability of the challenger to be able to mobilize people to come out and vote okay. i think as i see it now this is what seems to be the trend for me at least so what you're saying, and let me get it very succinctly from you, what you're saying, a low voter turnout doesn't necessarily mean either anti-incumbency, 
nor does it suggest pro incumbency it just suggests who was more effective the party which was most effective in getting its voters out presumably will have an advantage am i correct uh, you are absolutely absolutely right in saying that rajdeep but i would add the the the, the rider to that that when a ruling party has been in power for a long period of time mm -hmm. a low voter turnout could be an alarm bell because it may be a sign of dissatisfaction it could be a sign of complacency uh, it also should worry the opposition because it means that if the voter turnout is not high mm -hmm. they have not been able to bring out voters uh, on the questions that they raised okay let's leave it there i appreciate your joining us uh, professor shastri there on uh, what's happened today on day one of this battle for Gujarat. Now, all of this is playing out even as there are the side shows. One of those is Prime Minister Modi versus Congress President Malikarjun Kharge. Days after Congress Chief Malikarjun Kharge drew comparisons with the manner in which the Prime Minister goes to every election from municipal to general elections and effectively suggested this reflected a ten-headed Ravan-like approach, the BJP continued to attack the Congress president. Today, it was the Prime Minister leading the onslaught, accusing the Congress of disrespecting the Ramayan. As it turns out, even on the last day of campaigning today, or as we reach the last lap of campaigning, the politics of abuse and allegations continues. Take a look. नरेंद्र भाई ने कांग्रेस ना लोगों आटली बदी जात जात नहीं ढगला बन डजन बन गाड़ों दी दी जाए कांग्रेस पार्टी इना नेता हुए अधिकृत रिते क्या रे पश्चाता व्यक्त नथी करियो As the race enters the last lap, the Prime Minister once again made the now familiar pitch: Vote for Gujarat Asmita, vote for Modi. Congress President Malikarjun Kharge's recent attacks came in handy. Modi referred to his most recent one that compared him with Ravan. कांग्रेस पार्टी एने तो राम सेतु साधो एवं कोग्रेस पार्टी मैं गाड़ो बोलवा Modi's comment early in the day at a rally set the tone for the BJP campaign that saw the Prime Minister take out a road show in Ahmedabad. The longest one ever, according to the party. Union Home Minister Amit Shah echoed Modi, claiming the voter of Gujarat will punish Congress for targeting the prime minister jitni bhi bar gujarat mein pradhan mantri ji ke khilaf congress ne ab shabd upyog kiya utni bar har bar gujarat ki janta ne ballot box ke andar jawab diya is bar bhi iska jawab modi ji ke apmaan ka jawab gujarat ki janta zarur dega while the congress continues with its low key campaign the new challenger in the state the aam aadmi party fielded its top guns delhi cm arvind kejriwal punjab cm bhagwant man and former cricketer harbhajan singh took out a road show in ahmedabad परिवर्तन की लहर है क्योंकि भ्रष्टाचार पूरे गुजरात की प्रॉब्लम है गुंडागर्दी गरीबी पेपर फूटना बेरोजगारी तो लोग इस बार 27 साल पुराने सिस्टम को उखाड़ कर फेंकना चाहते हैं उनके पास पहले विकल्प नहीं था कांग्रेस बिक जाती थी फर्स्ट फेज ऑफ वोटिंग ओवर द पार्टी इज मेकिंग द फाइनल पुश वाइल बीजेपी इज फाइटिंग द इलेक्शन इन मोदीज नेम द कांग्रेस हैज मेड इट अ बैटल ऑफ आइडियोलॉजीज and aam aadmi party a fight for change 
which idea prevails, the voter will decide. Bureau Report, India Today. Now, one of the more interesting characters in this Gujarat election is Hardik Patel. Five years ago, the then 24-year-old Hardik Patel was the face of the Patidar agitation that almost defeated the mighty BJP. This time, Hardik has switched sides. He's contesting on a BJP ticket from Viramgam near Ahmedabad. I caught up with Hardik Patel on the campaign trail to find out why has the agitationist of 2017 now become part of the BJP five years later. Here are excerpts from that interview. Hardik, how are you? I Tiger is alive. Why not? क्या दिक्कत होगी मैं इसलिए पूछ रहा हूं क्योंकि मुझे याद है इसी विरम गांव में मैं आया था 5 साल पहले तब आप एक तरह से कैंपेन कर रहे थे लेकिन बीजेपी के खिलाफ आज बीजेपी के कैंडिडेट बन के आए हैं क्या फर्क हुआ क्या वजह हुई कि हार्दिक पटेल 5 साल में इतना बड़ा आपने चेंज कर दिया 17 का चीज अलग था क्योंकि वह सामाजिक मुद्दा था सामाजिक मुद्दा था सामाजिक मुद्दा खत्म हो गया केंद्र सरकार और राज्य सरकार ने 10% रिजर्वेशन लागू किया तो उसके बाद एक सामाजिक मुद्दा जो था जिसके लिए लड़ाई 17 में थी वो खत्म हो गया था यानी पार्टीदार का जो मुद्दा जो मुद्दा था वो एक्चुअली खत्म हो गया था तो फिर पॉलिटिकली स्वाभाविक है कि एजिटेशन स्वार्थ पे नहीं होते कभी एजिटेशन मुद्दों पे होते और मुद्दों के साथ जब आंदोलन हो गया था पूरा तो स्वाभाविक से पॉलिटिकल पार्टी ज्वाइन करा ये कहा जाता है कि आपके खिलाफ जो केसेस किए गए थे बीजेपी ने विड्रॉ किए इसलिए हार्दिक पटेल ने साइड विड्रॉ हो गए आपको मालूम है विड्रॉ हो गए ये पूछ ये कहां जा रहा है कि आपके खिलाफ बत्ती से अभी भी बत्तीस के साथ के खिलाफ तो केसेस भी ड्रॉ नहीं हुए वो तो समयांतर पर कोर्ट में हो गए ना वो तो कोर्ट से होते हैं उसमें आपको लड़ना पड़ता है न्यायिक लड़ाई लड़नी पड़ती है तो निश्चित रूप से हमें वो भरोसा है कि हम न्यायिक लड़ाई लड़के अपने जो केसेस है उसको विड्रॉ कराएं आपको कांग्रेस और इनमें क्या फर्क लगा बीजेपी और कांग्रेस के बीच में जो लोग गुजरात की गौरव और अस्मिता के लिए काम करते हैं हम उसके साथ रहते हैं भारतीय जनता पार्टी गुजरात की अस्मिता और गौरव के लिए लगातार लड़ती है कांग्रेस ने लगातार गुजरात की गौरव और अस्मिता के खिलाफ काम करने का प्रयास किया है तो आप कह रहे हैं कि कांग्रेस जाना ही आपकी गलती बिल्कुल थी? बिल्कुल सब लोग इसलिए तो सब लोग छोड़ रहे हैं मैं अकेला थोड़ी वो तो सिंधिया ने भी छोड़ा है गुलाब नबी आजाद जी ने भी छोड़ा है अशोक तंवर ने भी छोड़ा है सब लोग धीरे धीरे समझते हैं वो सब लोग उनसे दूर जा, जा रहे हैं खफा हो रहे हैं कांग्रेस कहती है स्वार्थ के लिए क्या राजनीतिक स्वार्थ के, के लिए कांग्रेस तो सब कुछ कहेगी उसने तो पूरे गुजरात को स्वार्थ में खफा है हार्दिक भाई यही फर्क है 2017 में आप एजिटेशन कर रहे थे आप हीरो बन गए पटेल समाज के अब आप लोगों को के पास जा रहे हैं वोट मांगने तो क्या तो ये सबसे बड़ा फर्क है क्योंकि आप एक तरह से इस बार चुनाव खुद लड़ रहे हैं तब आप एक तरह से पटेल एजिटेशन के फेस बने थे आप किस तरह से देखते हैं सबसे बड़ी दिक्कत क्या हुई है चुनाव लड़ने में दिक्कत कोई मुझे नहीं बीजेपी पूरी तरह से आपके साथ है सब लोग लोग साथ है लोग साथ है बीजेपी साथ है सब लोग साथ है किसी को दिक्कत नहीं है ये कि आप बाहर से आए हैं आप यंग हैं मेरे पापा बीजेपी के मूल कार्यकर्ता रहे इस जगह जगह को मजबूत करने वाले मेरे पापा है हम बाहर से नहीं आए हम तो हमारे मूल घर में है आज आपने अपने स्पीच में राम मंदिर की भी बात की कि ये तो मुद्दा जो था ये बीजेपी का मुद्दा था तब जब आप कांग्रेस में थे तब आपको ये मुद्दा याद नहीं आया आप आप शायद पत्रकार के रूप में कई बार भूल जाते हैं मैं वही प्रॉब्लम है ना कि जब मैं वहाँ था तब भी राम मंदिर के लिए मैंने इक्कीस हजार डोनेशन दिया था आपको आइडिया ना हो तो बता दो जो ऑफिशियली मेरे ट्विटर पे लिखा है और जिस अकाउंट में गया उसको रिसीव कॉपी भी आ गई आप हिंदुत्व के साथ थे जब आप कांग्रेस में तीन सौ जब हटाई गई तो मैंने ही पहले कहा था ना कि तीन हटाना बिल्कुल सही फैसला है क्योंकि भारत एक होना चाहिए तो फिर आप गाड़ी में हट जाइए तो चलते चलते बात गाड़ी आप पर लगी लेना है गाड़ी में चले या कहा चले कैसे गाड़ी में चले प्रवीण भाई गाड़ी में चलते हैं जब आप नरेंद्र भाई जी का नाम लेते हैं मैं मुझे वो वीडियोस याद आते हैं जब उन, आपने उन पर कठोर प्रहार किया था मोदी जी पर तो वो हार्दिक और ये हार्दिक में कैसे ये बदलाव कैसे आ गया राजदीप जी आंदोलन आक्रमकता से ही होते है भाई हिंदुस्तान में पहली बार ऐसा हुआ है कि टेन प्रतिशत रिजर्वेशन लागू हुआ है जब आपको कहा जाता है हार्दिक पटेल अपॉर्चुनिस्ट है हार्दिक पटेल ने अब केवल अपने पॉलिटिकल एम्बिशन के लिए यहाँ से वहाँ चले गए वर्किंग प्रेसिडेंट बने कांग्रेस के अच्छा। और जब आपको लगा कि कांग्रेस में आपका चल नहीं रहा है इसीलिए आपने स्विच किया नहीं मैं वही बोल रहा हूँ आपका आपका हुद्दा मतलब आपका जिम्मेवारी क्या है अभी न्यूज में और फिर आपको ये भूमि ना दे तो क्या करोगे जिम्मेदारी लेके घूमते रहोगे किसी का इंटरव्यू नहीं करने देंगे तो राजदीप जी क्या करोगे आप पद देना बड़ी बात नहीं है उसके लिए कौन सा वर्क दिया आपको 
तो आप कह रहे हैं कांग्रेस में आपको पद दिया लेकिन कोई काम नहीं दिया गया नहीं था ना काम राजनीति की वो लोग काम के लिए करते हैं ना राजनीति पद के लिए नहीं होती और यहाँ पर भी मैं छह महीने कार्यकर्ता की भूमिका में था तो आपने राहुल गांधी से ये बात नहीं कही कि देखिए मेरे मुझे पद दिया कोई कार्य नहीं है ये हो रहा है आप आपने राहुल गांधी के साथ संपर्क नहीं किया क्योंकि एक समय तो आप राहुल गांधी की बड़ी प्रशंसा कर रहे थे देखिए राहुल गांधी के पास विजन ही नहीं है तो उससे बात करके मैं क्या करूंगा कितनी बार बोला कि गुजरात के लिए आप गुजरात के खिलाफ लगातार बोलिए मत गुजरात के व्यापारियों को गाली मत दीजिए गुजरात की अस्मिता और गौरव पर लगातार सवाल मत उठाइए लेकिन उनको समझना ही नहीं था तो अपन ने छोड़ दिया और अब मैं कांग्रेस के बारे में बात करूंगा तो मुझे क्या क्या फायदा है विकास की बात करते हैं जनता के सामने दो बड़े मुद्दे में देख रहा हूँ गुजरात में युवाओं के क्योंकि आप युवा है एक बेरोजगारी और दूसरा जो पेपर लीक्स हो रहे हैं उसकी वजह से एजुकेशन सिस्टम ये दोनों पर क्या आप जोर दे पाएंगे क्योंकि क्या आप मानते हैं ये बड़े परेशानियां हैं यंग लोगों के लिए देखिए बेरोजगारी की जब तक जहां तक बात है तो ये आपके नॉलेज के लिए कि गुजरात रोजगारी के मामले में आज भी अव्वल है गुजरात में स्थानिक नौकरियों में और सरकारी नौकरियों में गुजराती मतलब यहाँ के नौजवानों को प्रथम जिम्मेवारी भी मिलती है और अपना अपॉर्चुनिटी भी मिलता है सर तलाटी की नौकरी के लिए लाखों ने अप्लाई किया केवल कुछ सौ लोगों को लिए नौकरी मिल रही थी लाखों में अप्लीकेशन हुई गलत बात है सौ तो, लोगों को नहीं मिलती बारह तेरह हजार लोगों की रिक्वायरमेंट होती है और सरकार उतने लोगों पर लाखों ने अपॉइंटमेंट तो करेंगे ना लाखों ने अप्लाई किया भाई मैं क्लार्क मैं क्लार्क का जॉब कर रहा हूँ और मुझे तलाटी के लिए एग्जाम देना है तो मैं भी अप्लाई करूंगा नहीं क्या आप कह रहे हैं की बेरोजगारी नहीं है बेरोजगारी तो प्रदेश के हिसाब से होगी सरकारी नौकरी दस लाख ही होती है मेरे भाई सरकारी नौकरी दस लाख से ज्यादा एक करोड़ नौकरी हो सकती है बताइए मुझे तो स्वाभाविक है सरकारी नौकरी के लिए सबकी इच्छा है होती कि मैं सरकारी नौकरी के लिए अप्लाई करूं तो वो तो आंकड़ा बड़ा दिखेगा लेकिन गुजरात में सरकारी नौकरी हो या प्राइवेट नौकरी स्थानिक नौजवानों को जो पढ़े लिखे है शिक्षित है उन लोगों को फायदा मिलता भी है और उनको मिलती भी है दूसरा आपने कहा पेपर लीक घटना मैं बिल्कुल मानता हूँ पेपर लीक की घटना नौजवानों के भविष्य को धुंधला करती है और उसके लिए कानून बनना चाहिए मैंने भारतीय जनता पार्टी में रहते हुए भी कहा था और जब मैं नहीं था तब भी कहा था हम एक ऐसे रास्ते पर जा रहे हम हाईवे देखते हैं बिल्कुल फर्स्ट क्लास है आप ही के वीरम गांव में अहमदाबाद से नहीं दूर देखिए रास्ते किस तरह से हो गए क्या गुजरात के दो गुजरात है एक जो चमक रहा है दूसरा जो चमक नहीं रहा है देखिए ये एक गांव से दूसरे गांव को जोड़ने वाले रास्ते हैं और ये पहली जिम्मेवारी होती विधायकों की कि विधायकों को, को ये काम करवाना चाहिए और आपकी नॉलेज के लिए यहाँ दस साल से कांग्रेस का विधायक है बिल्कुल है और इसीलिए लोग कह रहे हैं आपको डिफिकल्ट सीट दी गई है तो मैं डिफिकल्टी चीज ही पसंद करता हूँ हम गए थे मिलने जिग्नेश मेवानी उन्होंने कहा कोई मुझे खरीद नहीं सकता हार्दिक और बाकियों की बात तो अलग है मुझे कोई खरीद नहीं सकता तो कहीं ना कहीं उनका भी इशारा था कि आप हो या अल्पेश ठाकुर जो पार्टी बदल के गए बीजेपी ने आपको खरीद लिया एक तरह से अरे राजदीप जी सवाल ये नहीं है कि पार्टी बदली क्यों बदली और किस लिए बदली अके हम अकेले ने थोड़ी बदली कई लोगों ने बदला है पार्टी इस बार क्या आपको लगता है कि पूरी तरह से पाटीदार समाज एक तरफा होगा पाटीदार भारतीय जनता पार्टी के साथ ही रहा है क्योंकि भरोसा रहता है जहाँ भरोसा है वहाँ पर भारतीय जनता पार्टी के साथ समाज रहते और सिर्फ पाटीदार समाज नहीं गुजरात के सात करोड़ लोग भारतीय जनता पार्टी के भरोसा करते और आपके कई तो सर्वे आ गए हैं ना कि कितनी 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 सीटों के साथ सरकार बन रही है कितने 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 सीटें आएंगी बीजेपी को एक सौ पचास तो आप कह रहे माधव सिंह सोलंकी का रिकॉर्ड तोड़ देगी बीजेपी इस समय ऑल रिकॉर्ड टूटेंगे और एक सीटों के साथ फिर एक बार भारतीय जनता पार्टी की सरकार बनेगी हार्दिक भाई आपने हमसे बात की वी विश यू ऑल द वेरी बेस्ट अभी भी आप अपने आप को यंग टर्क मानते हैं कि नहीं हाँ अभी भी यंग अभी भी यंग है आप भी यंग है ना आपके बालों में अभी तक सफेद ही नहीं आई पूरे बाल सफेद यही तो फर्क है थैंक यू वेरी मच हार्दिक भाई ऑल द वेरी बेस्ट थैंक यू हार्दिक पटेल देर ऑन द कैंपेन ट्रेल जस्टिफाइंग हिस्स स्विच फ्रॉम द कांग्रेस टू द बीजेपी बट वॉट ऑफ द कांग्रेस This time, the party appears to be running a relatively muted campaign in Gujarat, focusing on local issues. Rahul Gandhi has just addressed two rallies. Priyanka Gandhi Vadra didn't even set foot in the state. I spoke to Congress in charge for Gujarat, Raghu Sharma, about exactly what the party's campaign focus had been. Listen in to Raghu Sharma. Raghu Sharma ji, ये बताइए. इस चुनाव में क्या कांग्रेस ने एक रणनीति बना ली है कि हम लोकल इश्यूज पर बात करेंगे हम मोदी वर्सेस राहुल नहीं करना चाहते क्या इस दिस द स्ट्रेटेजी कि लोकल करो हम राहुल वर्सेस मोदी नहीं जीत सकते सीधी स्ट्रेटेजी है गुजरात का चुनाव जीतना 24 का चुनाव आएगा तो मोदी जी बीच में आएंगे ये चुनाव तो सीधा लोकल इश्यूज पे है आज गुजरात की जनता 
किस हाल में जी रही है सत्ताईस साल बाद उसका हिसाब देना बीजेपी को बीच में मोदी जी कहाँ गए नहीं यहाँ चीफ मिनिस्टर नहीं उनका नहीं बट बी, ए, मोदी जी के नाम पर बीजेपी चुनाव एक तरह से लड़ रही है तो कहीं ना कहीं मोदी जी की लोकप्रियता का बीजेपी एडवांटेज ले रही है गुजरात में और कांग्रेस का उसका क्या रिस्पांस है अगर लोकप्रियता है तो आठ तारीख का इंतजार करना चाहिए बीजेपी को आज आम आदमी महंगाई से परेशान है बेरोजगारी से परेशान है इलिशिट लिखकर लोग मारे जा रहे हैं ड्रग ट्रैफिकिंग का सेंटर बन गया गुजरात 22 पेपर लीक हुए नई भर्ती हुई नहीं मोरबी जैसी घटना होती है बीजेपी के लोगों का हाथ होता है उनको संरक्षण मिल रहा है किसी को पनिशमेंट नहीं निर्दोष लोग मारे जा रहे हैं यहाँ क्या सरकार नाम की चीज नहीं है आज चार साल बाद कोविड मिसमैनेजमेंट में पूरी सरकार बदली आपने मुख्यमंत्री बदला पूरी कैबिनेट बदली उसके बाद जो नई सरकार आई उस सरकार के लिए बीजेपी के अध्यक्ष क्या बोलते हैं कि हमारे चीफ मिनिस्टर बहुत सीधे हैं उनको ये मालूम नहीं है कौन सी फाइल पे साइन करना है और कौन सी पे नहीं करना है इसलिए हमको चौकस रखनी पड़ती है ये रिमोट कंट्रोल गवर्नमेंट गुजरात को कब तक देंगे आप नहीं नहीं मोदी जी खुद क्यों नहीं चुनाव लड़ते नहीं सवाल ये है कि बीजेपी अमित शाह आते और कहते हैं कि हमने एक सबक सिखाया दो के बाद मोदी जी कहते हैं कांग्रेस के राज में यहाँ तूफान होता था अमित शाह जी भी यही कहते थे कि कम्युनल राइट्स जब कांग्रेस की सरकार थी तब होता था वो कहते हैं कि टेररिज्म को संरक्षण कांग्रेस ने दिया तो उन्होंने एक तरह से यूनिफॉर्म सिविल कोड हो या टेररिज्म हो उन्होंने कहा ये नेशनल इलेक्शन है ये गुजरात के इशू नहीं है और जो पुरानी बातें ले लेके वो आ रहे हैं हर चीज का जवाब कांग्रेस दे सकती है लेकिन आज गुजरात की जनता जवाब मांग रही है कांग्रेस पार्टी विपक्ष में है हम जवाब मांगते हैं वो जवाब नहीं है उनके पास आपके पास क्या रोड मैप है महंगाई कम करने का आपके पास क्या रोड मैप है बेरोजगारी कम करने का आपके पास क्या रोड मैप है देश की इकोनॉमी को ठीक करने का उस पर बात नहीं कर रहे नहीं, आपके पास कांग्रेस के पास क्या रोड मैप है कि अगर कांग्रेस की सरकार आए तो कर्फ्यू नहीं होगा दंगे नहीं होगे ये बीजेपी का कहना है हमारे अस्सी और नब्बे के दशक में दंगे हुआ करते थे ये दंगों के पीछे किसका हाथ था हमारे यहाँ कहावत है की जब चोरी रोकनी हो तो चोर को थानेदार बना दो कौन दंगों के पीछे था गुजरात की जनता जानती है इसलिए मेहरबानी करके इन सब इश्यूज को मत लाओ बात करो महंगाई पे बात करो बेरोजगारी पे बात करो अर्थव्यवस्था पे पेट में रोटी चाहिए आदमी को हाथ में रोजगार चाहिए ये जो मुद्दे ला रहे हैं ना वो इसीलिए ला रहे हैं की पूरी तरह से फेल हुई है गवर्नमेंट यहाँ क्लासिक गुजराती सेठिया थाली टाइम टू फॉरगेट पॉलिटिक्स बहुत अच्छा है कब्रिस्तान फूड अमंग द डेड गुजराती लव द स्वीट चैलेंज अभी जनसभा कीजिए उससे दुगनी ताकत में जनसभा खड़ी करूंगा एक समय तो आप राहुल गांधी की बड़ी प्रशंसा कर रहे थे ये राहुल गांधी के पास विजन ही नहीं है तो उससे बात करके मैं क्या करूँगा सूर्य कुमार यादव आई एम इन दिटी ऑफ माई बर्थ जन्मभूमि Okay, let's uh, turn from there. That's coming up tomorrow night. Elections on my plate, but let's turn to tonight's Gujarat Ground Report. While Surat may be known as India's diamond hub, it's Saurashtra's Bhavnagar that often is less known for its diamond sorting. The truth is, it's famous therefore for garnering employment to young girls and women now who are all working in the diamond business. Tonight's Ground Report comes from Bhavnagar from Milan Sharma. <laughs> 18-year-old Pooja lost her father to a long illness a month ago. She now works at this diamond manufacturing factory in Bhavnagar. Pooja, you have been working here for 6 months and what work do you do? I work here for 6 months and I work here for the set-up. Why did you want to do this work? My father is sick, so I have to take care of him. So I didn't have to take care of him at home. तो आप पूरा घर चलाती यहाँ पे काम करते पूजा हैज स्टडीड टिल ट्वेल्थ स्टैंडर्ड हर सिस्टर आरती ड्रॉप आउट आफ्टर क्लास इलेवन एंड इज वर्किंग इन द डायमंड सॉर्टिंग एंड पॉलिशिंग यूनिट घर में सारी जिम्मेदारियों में बेतू पड़ी थी जिम्मेदारी है इसलिए आप यहाँ पर काम करती हैं लेकिन आ, काम करना यहाँ पसंद है आपको अच्छा लगता है यहाँ पर काम करना हाँ हमको अच्छा लगता है क्या अच्छा लगता है यहाँ पे 
यहाँ पे जो कंफर्टेबल है मेनी विमेन लाइक पूजा एंड आरती अर्न देर लिविंग वर्किंग एट द स्मॉल डायमंड यूनिट्स थ्राइविंग इन भावनगर यहाँ पे काम करके मतलब क्या क्या अच्छा लगता है क्या सुविधा है आपके लिए कैसी चीजें हैं सब सब लेडीज के लिए अच्छा है इधर कुछ भी बुरा नहीं है इधर ये जो आप उसको साइड में रखिए दर्शन भाई गबानी अ डायमंड मैन्युफैक्चरर एक्सप्लेन्स दैट स्किल इज इजी टू लर्न बिग डायमंड सब सूरत में बनते हैं स्मॉल डायमंड यहाँ पे होता है स्मॉल डायमंड में क्या होता है की वर्कर ज्यादा चाहिए बिग डायमंड के हिसाब से यहाँ पे वर्कर ज्यादा चाहिए तो भावनगर ज्यादा वर्कर को नौकरी दे सकता है While Surat is now the diamond hub, Bhavnagar was where the business took shape. Jain vyapari Surat mein diamond ka kaam chalu karte the. Wo Surat se Bhavnagar aaye aur yahan bahut bada matlab kaam chalu kiya. Jaise jaise badhte gaye kaam aur badhta gaya tab tab sab log fir se wapas Surat shift ho gaye. Acha. Kyunki ek baat to ye thi yahan security thoda bahut wo problem tha aur dusri baat ye thi ki Surat se Bombay wo nazdik girta tha. तो उस वजह से ज्यादा जो जो लोग बहुत बड़े हो गए वो सब भावनगर से ही सूरत गए हैं। There are 700 diamond units in Bhavnagar for cutting and polishing small diamonds that are less than a carat or so, giving employment to nearly 1.25 lakh people. In recent times, Bhavnagar has seen 27% increase in diamond exports. The industry is the key to the city's growth. The small diamond assorting industries in Bhavnagar is what is providing employment to many women and especially young girls who have responsibility of families on them. With Milan Sharma in Bhavnagar, Pure Report, India Today. Now, India took over the presidency of the G20 today. The government is marking this by illuminating over 100 historical monuments across the country. India is also showcasing Nagaland's world-famous Hornbill Festival with the Prime Minister writing a blog today giving his vision for India's presidency. What does this mean for India over the next 12 months? Take a look at tonight's other special, India as the G20 President. I'm proud of the leadership. I confide to Prime Minister Modi of India. One Earth, One Family, One Future. With this motto, India assumed the presidency of G20 on Thursday, days after Indonesian President Joko Widodo handed it over to Mr. Modi in November. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, in an article published by several news outlets across the world, penned his vision for the Global Forum. Emphasizing on universal sense of oneness, Prime Minister Modi urged member nations to make India's G20 presidency one of healing, harmony and hope. India draws its inspiration for the theme of presidency from the phrase Vasudhev Kutumbakam, which means the world is one family. G20 India 2023 One Earth, One Family one future. Addressing a university connect event in Delhi, External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar said, as the mother of democracy, India's G20 presidency will be consultative, collaborative and decisive. As India takes charge of G20 presidency, a hundred monuments across India are being illuminated with the group's logo for the next seven days. India is also showcasing Nagaland's annual Hornbill Festival to mark the event. India assumes presidency of the G20 and we begin by celebrating it over here at the Hornbill Festival in Kohima in Nagaland. Look at the colour, the culture, the traditions and all that will be on display over here when India takes on presidency of the G20. Now there is going to be a lot of connect. India is going to host uh, foreign uh, diplomats, uh, foreign governments in many parts of the country. India will hold nearly 200 events across 50 cities during its presidency. The G20 summit will be held in India in September next year. In Kohima with Geeta Mohan, Bureau Report, 
India Today. And joining me now is uh, India's uh, G20 Sherpa, former chief executive at Niti Aayog, Amitabh Khan joins me. Amitabh Khan, what does this really mean, taking over the G20 presidency? If I were to ask you your primary objective of the government of India over the next 12 months, what is it that you hope to achieve with the G20 presidency? So, Rajdeep, uh, G20 is uh, important because uh, it uh, accounts for about 85% of global GDP and about 75% of the global trade. It also accounts for part of the global population. Now, in the past, uh, if you look at it from the history of GDP, uh, of uh, global, several global challenges that have occurred, GD, G20 has played a very critical and a very significant role, uh, whether it was the 2008 uh, financial crisis or the establishment of the Financial Stability Board or uh, the Basel Three norms and so on. Uh, more than that, it, it, it brings together all the top leaders of the world. And if uh, challenges which the world is confronted with today, the challenge of slowing down of growth, of uh, 200 million people having been pushed below poverty line, of 100 million people having lost their jobs due to COVID, or climate action and climate finance, or the global supply chains having been disrupted, or global debt. I think there's no other body other than the G20 which can bring global consensus for action. When I look at your slogan for G20 presidency, one earth, one family, one future, what does that really mean in concrete terms? I come back to it. What, are we, what is the message India is really sending out there? So it's a very, very important uh, uh, theme of one earth, one family, one future. Because the world today is owned by geopolitics. Uh, there are challenges on fuel, food, and fertilizer. Uh, there is a huge challenge of uh, countries crumbling apart on yeah, because of global debt. And therefore, what it really says is that we are all part of one cosmic web and that there is university in diversity, that there may be different geographical mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, distances, there may be different economic models, there may be different political philosophies, but eventually we are part of one uh, cosmos and therefore all of us need to work together for citizens of the world. Uh, and that's important and that's been uh, highlighted, uh, highlighted by the Prime Minister in his editorial today that uh, uh, eventually, all countries need to work together to find s solutions to the problems of uh, the vast number of people in the world. And that is really the key message of Vasudev Kutumbuk. You know, but that's, you know, that sounds again good. But the truth is that while we talk of this one cosmos, you've got one G20 member, Russia, which is at war with Ukraine. You've got uh, China with its expansionism. You've got the global fault lines over a possible recession blowing up in the next 12 months. Aren't all these big concerns? How is India actually going to play a role in ensuring that these global economic and political fault lines don't widen further? So uh, last year, in fact, when Indonesia, uh, one of uh, the emerging markets held its uh, presidency throughout the year. Throughout the year, there was no consensus. None of the meetings could come out with a communique. It was feared that there would be no communique. And eventually in Bali, finally, we negotiated for over five days from morning six o'clock to night. We could arrive at a communique and it was a fairly ambitious communique which brought together not merely the G7 but all the emerging markets in Russia and China together. So, uh, and that was endorsed by leaders. So leaders have this big ability to rise about above issues. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, that is the critical thing that if leaders get together, they are, have this opportunity to interact with each other. And then they are the ones who will solve global problems of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite sure that during India's presidency, India is probably the only country which has been, uh, you know, which is able to uh, discuss, debate, interact, uh, with all uh, countries of the world and it is a country where the Prime Minister has gone on to say that this is not an era of war, this is an age of diplomacy and dialogue and therefore I think uh, India's Prime Minister will play a very critical, a very significant role mm -hmm. and uh, I, to my mind, uh, his leadership, not, you know, that 
G20 presidency has three critical things to my mind. One is the political narrative and uh, the personality of the political leader, which is important, and the development work that has been done within the country. The second is the content which you build up as you drive uh, the, the broad uh, priorities of, of uh, G20, which we have done. We've prepared the content, we've sent out the issue notes, we are opening them up for debate and discussion at the Sherpa meeting on 5th and 6th. And thirdly, uh, how you conduct the G20, that is in terms of the logistics, we are doing this over 200 uh, uh, meetings in 55 different cities. We are well prepared. Our objective is really to uh, culturally elevate and spiritually invigorate every single uh, G20 visitor. Uh, they may come as the mm -hmm. representative of their country, but we'd like to send them back as a brand ambassador of India. So on all three fronts, mm -hmm. uh, we are well fully prepared. We are fully prepared and we would like to do it with clockwork pressure with great amount of efficiency. You know, you're speaking about organizing 200 events over the next year across 55 cities in the country. One criticism that is coming from the opposition in India is that uh, the G20 will be used as a platform by the BJP government, the Modi government for the 2024 elections. There's a controversy over the logo. The G20 has the lotus, which has attracted criticism from the opposition, which says it's similar to the BJP symbol. So is this G20 not just about brand India, but also in a sense about marketing brand Modi and brand BJP uh, ahead of the uh, uh, 2024 elections? This is an absurd criticism. G20 uh, logo, which is uh, based on a national flower, mm -hmm. was actually a part of the 20 uh, paisa coin, uh, which Reserve Bank of India came out in uh, 1967, as early as 1967. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at that coin. Uh, so it re represents the petals. What we've tried to uh, really say is about talk about peace and harmony. We've tried to talk about the seven continents in the world. We've tried to talk about unity and diversity. And uh, therefore, this criticism is both unfair and uh, unjust to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, about doing the events, uh, it's important to, uh, when you do events in 55 cities, uh, you're really improving the quality of infrastructure in these cities. You're preparing these cities to host these people. You're promoting India as a great travel and tourism destination. And uh, I was just in Udaipur two days back. I've seen the vast amount of transformation that has undergone in Udaipur. And all credit to the state government for really, really, uh, you know, doing a remarkable job of Udaipur in the last uh, several uh, weeks. And therefore, uh, what so, I foresee is that every single state, every single state will be an active participant. This will be done in the utmost spirit of cooperative federalism. You know, I, I want to come back, though, to the critical question that uh, of dealing with China. A uh, part of the G20, according to Pankaj Saran, former deputy NSA, this will be India's biggest challenge as G20 pre uh, president dealing with an expansionist China, a China pursuing a zero COVID policy that has resulted in unrest in that country. How does India actually ensure that China acts on all its commitments that it makes at G20? No, we'll work together like we work with G7, we work with Russia, we'll work together. And I think it's not just... Uh, you know, the challenge in G20 is to bring consensus around a vast number of developmental growth issues, financial inclusion issues, etc. And I'm quite confident, I'm absolutely confident that we'll work very closely with China uh, so that we are able to evolve consensus on a vast a range of issues. There are not only, uh, this is not the only challenge, there are many other challenges. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite sure we'll, uh, quite, we'll adopt a very positive, very constructive, very forward-looking approach. The Prime Minister has said that India's presidency will be very decisive, it will be action-oriented, it will be ambitious, and we'll live up to that. You know, in conclusion, listening to you, it seems that this is going to be a mega event, that all is very well. But is there any concern, any downside at the moment, particularly, as I said, we are heading towards a possible global recession? I, I kept mentioning China. Uh, is there anything that we should be worried about? Any global headwinds that we should be worried about as we go ahead through this 
uh, you know, through the one year as G20 president? No, there are very many challenges which will unfold as we go along. Uh, many things are not under our control. We don't know how geopolitics will play out. Mm -hmm. We do not know uh, whether there will be another, uh, another set of health challenges across the world. We do not know what is going to unfold before us 10 months, uh, next 10 months before we have the leader summit and then another two months after that mm -hmm. till the 1st of December of next year. Mm -hmm. But we are very well prepared. We will mm -hmm. continue to face challenges as they come along. Mm -hmm. We are, we will confront them as we come along and we'll, uh, we are determined to come out victorious. Let's leave it there. Uh, uh, Amitabh Khan, we wish you and uh, all those organizing the G20 to showcase India to the world the very best. Let's hope that it is much more than just uh, another event, that it becomes actually showcasing India in all its diversity. Appreciate your joining us here on uh, the news today. Thank you so much. Okay, let's turn from there to the story that we've been tracking the last couple of weeks, the revelations that keep coming out in the Shraddha Walker murder case that continue to send shockwaves. After allegedly confessing to killing Shraddha in the lie detector test, Suspect Aftab Punawala has once again confessed to his crime, we are told, in the narco test. Aftab allegedly admitted that he used weapons to chop off Shraddha's body and dispose of her phone and clothes. Here's a detailed report. Yes, I killed Shraddha. I used a weapon to cut Shraddha's body. I disposed of the weapon. I threw Shraddha's mobile phone. I disposed of Shraddha's clothes. Some of the big reported confessions by Delhi's butcher. Aftab Amin Punawala during his narco test aimed at unraveling the mind of a psychopath. On Thursday, Aftab was taken to Delhi's Ambedkar Hospital at 8.30 a.m. After getting some time to settle down, he was taken for pre-narco health tests. His blood pressure, pulse rate, heartbeat and temperature were monitored. The doctors took him for the narco after his vital parameters were found to be okay. After Punawala was given a consent form to sign before the procedure began. Then the actual narco test started and was videographed. After was administered the anesthetic which made him lose his ability to imagine, putting him in a semi-conscious, hypnotic state, making him less inhibited. Forensic Science Laboratory psychology expert and others kept watch over the process as questions were asked to the accused. Initial questions were about his name and personal details. He was then asked about how he killed Shraddha. Following questions were about how he destroyed evidence. The test lasted one and a half hours in the operation theatre. Aftab Punawala was calm during the test while his vital parameters were stable. Officials termed the process a success. ये test conduct हो गया है ठीक ठीक से. दोबारा उसको लाया जाएगा सर? अगर जरूरत पड़ी तो post narco test भी किया जाएगा. The police will now match his answers with lie detector test revelations that were carried out just before. He will be questioned again if there is any discrepancy. Which Raya Chatterjee and Arvind Ojha in Delhi bureau report India today. Let's take a break. Coming up next, our good news today story. It comes from Kanpur. We'll tell you more. You're watching the news today. News without the noise. दस गोलियां ले ले गोलियां नहीं रज्जा गो ली पर बाहर तो दस लोग हैं दस हो या पूरी बस अब तो बस वन है तो डन है इसको कोई वॉचो वॉच कराओ जब वॉचो में मिले ढेर सारे ओडिटी एप्स एक ही प्लान में तो हर कोई बोलेगा वॉचो वन है तो डन है वॉचो प्लान स्टार्टिंग एट जस्ट फॉर टू रुपीज पर मंथ आज ही सब्सक्राइब करें और पाए सिलेक्ट प्लान आरोप एक महीना कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री
Dr. Qureshi, do you believe that state funding is the only way? I look at the numbers, both in the context of electoral bonds as well as now contributions through cash. One party gets over 80% of the funding. It doesn't make it a level playing field. Yes, uh, indeed. You know, that's what uh, Dr. Choker and I have been saying for a long time. Um, of course, uh, Dr. Choker prefers to call it uh, public funding rather than state funding. And I agree with him. Uh, is, but I would say it's not a state funding of elections, but a state funding of uh, political parties. Uh, Post-election, on the basis of their performance, on the basis of every vote they get, if we give them 100 rupees, that will work out to about 5,000, 6,000 crore rupees uh, in uh, after every election, which will be good good enough for them to uh, do their politics with. But correspondingly, there will be a total ban on corporate funding, which is actually the, the biggest problem today. Because there is no free lunch if the corporates uh, give you a donation. They want free licenses, they, they want uh, um, uh, contracts, and they even want bank loans with which they run away regularly. So therefore, I think public funding of uh, um, political party based on performance, 100 rupees mm. per vote, is a very good uh, formula and it needs to be considered seriously. Welcome back. Let's turn to tonight's good news today's story and it turns, comes from Kanpur where a Gurukulam or a popularly known as the school of happiness. Vulnerable children here are educated not solely by what's written in their books but also through upskilling and the art of living. It's our good news today's story. Students of Gurukulam call it the Khushiwala school or the school of happiness. Here, studies and fun go hand in hand. The children learn through activities like dance and music. We feel very good in Guru Gulam. We don't have much mind from Guru Gulam. Because, sir, we love you so much. And they teach us so much. We don't have to retire, but we don't have to retire. We don't have to work with our skills. We don't have to work with yoga, singing, acting. We don't have to work with our skills. Who likes to live in Guru Gulam? Who likes to live in Guru Gulam? There are nearly 150 underprivileged children at this Kanpur school run by a foundation set up by Uddeshya Sachan. He claims the school focuses on skills and art of living along with the basic education. I think that education is a matter of education. It 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 is a matter of education. और गुरुकुलम जैसे कई सारे विद्यालय में पूरे देश में स्थापित करना चाहता हूं जिससे समाज में एक अच्छा परिवर्तन ला सकूं। उद्देश्य इज लाइक अ फादर फिगर टू द चिल्ड्रन रिसेंटली अ वेरी टचिंग वीडियो ऑफ दीज किड्स विद सचान हैड गॉन वायरल समाज के लिए अच्छा कर रहा है मुझे अच्छा लगा और इसी तरीके ये सेवा करता रहे Sachan's initiative helps these vulnerable kids live a drug-free life. The Khushiwala School is spreading cheer and happiness. With Saba Ikram, Bureau Report, India Today. Let's leave you then with our image tonight in a landmark first. Stephanie Frappard of France will be the first woman to referee a men's World Cup match. Frappard will officiate the match being played between four-time world champions Germany and Costa Rica and Group E later tonight. It's another glass ceiling that's been broken. So let's cheer her as she referees that match. On that note, that's it on the news today. Thanks very much for watching. Stay well, stay safe. Good night. Shubhratri. Jai Hind. Namaskar.
Farmers are often blamed for not ensuring their crop to keep themselves immune to vagaries of nature.